Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. If you're a first time viewer, I'm happy you found me. Be sure to subscribe, like, comment, share, and click the notifications for new content. Again, welcome, and let's get into the story. After the Creek War, General Andrew Jackson ordered Major General Edmund P. Gaines and the 7th Infantry Regiment to construct a fort to protect settlers in the area known today as East Bruton, Alabama, from hostile Red Sticks. Red Sticks was a name given to the Creek Indians for the red-painted war clubs they carried, made up mostly of the upper towns that supported traditional leaderships and cultures. Fort Crawford is located in Escambia County, Alabama in the town of East Bruton. It was built in 1816 and sits on top of a high bluff overlooking Murder Creek and dates from the First Seminole War. of Horseshoe Bend was the culminating event of the Creek War of 1813 to 1814 in Alabama's Tallapoosa County. In reality, it was a side conflict of the War of 1812. The confrontation grew from a tribal civil war after Mississippi Territorial Militia Troops attacked a Creek Supply Party at Burnt Corn Creek, Alabama during the summer of 1813. On March 27, 1814, General Andrew Jackson defeated the Red Stick faction of the Creek Nation during the battle and for him, it was his first step into the White House. For the Creeks, it was the first step on their way to the Trail of Tears. Following the Battle of Horseshoe Bend in 1814, refugee parties of the Red Stick Creeks made their way south into the valleys of the Conecuh, Escambia, and Choctawatchee Rivers. They were pursued by U.S. troops, Choctaw warriors, and even some of their former allies led by William Weatherford. Weatherford was a Red Stick Creek warrior during the Creek War of 1813 to 1814 and leader in the Native American attack on Fort Mims in Alabama. He has been called Red Eagle by modern generations, but there is no evidence he ever used that title during the Creek conflict. Frontiersman Thomas Woodward, who would later go on to write about his time among the Creeks, said that Weatherford was known by the title Hopanika Fushal, which meant truthmaker. Weatherford was the son of a white trader and a Creek mother and born around 1791 in the Crusada area and grew up in the shadow of his uncle, a great Creek leader, Alexander McGillivary. Weatherford rose to prominence among both the Creeks and the Whites in 1803 when he assisted in the capture of William Augustus Bowles. The Maryland-born adventurer and pirate had challenged the leadership of McGillivary and declared an empire for himself among the Lower Creeks and Seminoles. Ten years later, in 1813, Weatherford became one of the principal war leaders of the Red Sticks. The movement was ignited by the Creeks by the prophet Hosea Francis, a follower of the Shawnee prophet Tenskwatawa. You try saying that one. Francis believed all Native Americans should unite peacefully and halt westward expansion of the United States. He urged his followers to give up the ways of the white man and return to their traditional Native American tribal roots. It is still a mystery of how Weatherford became involved in this movement. Some say he was forced to join the Red Sticks in order to save the lives of family members, and another version claims that he was captured by the Red Sticks and forced to join. There is also a third possibility. Found in the papers of Colonel Benjamin Hawkins, a U.S. agent for Indian Affairs, was a letter written by him during the late summer of 1813 that reports Weatherford was taken prisoner by the Red Sticks at the Battle of Burnt Corn Creek in Alabama. So, if this is correct, he joined the Red Stick movement after first fighting against it. Whatever the truth is, we know Weatherford was a key leader of the Red Stick attack on Fort Mims, an attack in 1813 that resulted in the deaths of more than 250 men, women, and children. He also fought at the Battle of Holy Ground in December of that same year. It was at Holy Ground that he is said to have made a spectacular leap on horseback from a high bluff into the Alabama River. Now, getting back to Fort Crawford, multiple raids were launched against these groups of Native American tribes and in 1814, Major General Andrew Jackson attacked the Spanish city of Pensacola, Florida. 
He drove out not only the Red Stick Warriors, but also a British Royal Battalion who were training, supplying, and arming them. Despite the success of these raids, the Red Sticks remained strong and formed an alliance with the Seminoles, who lived primarily along the Apalachicola to the Suwannee River in Florida. Attacks on settlers continued, even though the Creek War of 1813 to 1814 had ended. Minor fighting went on until 1816. There were concerns that war parties would disrupt the effort to survey the land surrendered by the Creeks to the U.S. under the Treaty of Fort Jackson and led to the decision to establish a permanent fort near the mouth of the Conecuh River. In order to build this post, a detachment of soldiers from the 7th U.S. Infantry was ordered to the Lower Conecuh in the late spring of 1816. The spot that was chosen was on a high bluff overlooking the east side of Murder Creek as the best location for the post. The creek is a major tributary of the Conecca River, which flows about two miles south of the bluff. At first, the encampment was called the Camp Near Kanaka, where the soldiers built a powder magazine and temporary quarters until they began work on the permanent fort. That project began in August 1816 when Brevet Major Richard Wartenberry of the 7th Infantry issued orders for the building of the fort. He ordered that all privates and non-commissioned officers involved in the work receive an extra gill of whiskey each day for each day employed. In his orders dated August 5, 1816, Wharton B. first used the name Fort Crawford for the new post for the first time. The construction project was a major ordeal for the men of the 7th U.S. Infantry. Heavy logs were cut from the forest and dragged to the side of the fort, where they were squared using hand tools. Because the army did not need to build the fort as a hasty defense, the soldiers were tasked with building a much more elaborate post. In order to describe the fort, Major J.M. Davis wrote about it in 1817. However, I will describe it in the past tense. The fort was a square log with two block houses at diagonal angles. The buildings were erected with square logs of about 8 or 10 inches square. The barracks for the officers and men formed three squares of the fort, the doctor's shop, guard house, and artificer's shops from the fort. The logs were laid so close as to touch with portholes cut in them, which made the fort a complete defense against small arms. Major J.M. Davis, April 1817. Based on Major Davis's description, Fort Crawford was not a normal stockade of upright logs. Instead, the four sides were formed of log buildings. The outside walls of the structures formed the walls of the fort. Fort Crawford stood as an important defense of the U.S. frontier for the next few years. In the summer and fall of 1818, it served as a base of operations for raids against Red Stick Creeks in the Florida Panhandle by U.S. and volunteer troops. Warriors taken prisoner during these raids were temporarily housed at the fort, along with their families. These raids were part of a conflict known today as the First Seminole War. It ranged across South Alabama, South Georgia, and North Florida. The raids, based from Fort Crawford, were amongst its westernmost actions. The cession of Florida to the United States by Spain in 1821 ended the need for the fort and it was evacuated. The soldiers of the 4th and 7th Infantry were withdrawn from the region in September of 1821. Although no visible trace or remains of Fort Crawford exist today, there is a historical marker at the intersection of Schaffner and Weaver Streets that interprets its history in a cemetery located atop of the bluffs. I want to add, I tried to get down to Fort Crawford last weekend, but for some reason it is closed off, possibly due to high waters as this town is prone to heavy flooding. Here are some pictures of what it looks like today at Fort Crawford. Basically, it is now used as a recreational park and there are no remains of structures left from the former fort.